thrilled we are to be here tonight. What, what better place to give a sneak peek of the worldwide sneak peek of the next version of Final Cut Pro to our audience? To an audience of 1,700 Final Cut Pro users. But that's not, that's not why we do what we do. This chart is nice, but it's not the reason which we get up in the morning. What we want to do is we want to create great software. We're all about creating an incredible user experience and great software that you guys can use. So the next question is, of course, what's next? I'm sure that's really why you're all here. And so now we're going to start unveiling a sneak peek of the next version of Final Cut Pro. And to help me with that task, I'm going to invite onto the stage Pete Steinau, who is the architect of the new version of Final Cut Pro. talk to you about what we've been up to lately. There's been a lot of talk around about what that might be, ranging from nothing at all, to just a little incremental update to the existing application, to a whole bunch of other interesting rumors about what we've been up to. But I get to be one of the people that shows you exactly what it is we've been up to, which is building a brand new version of Final Cut Pro. This is a rebuilt application built from the ground up re-architected based on modern technologies and ba based on leveraging all of the experience we've had building the existing Final Cut since its inception in 1999. So when you're building a new application, what do you do? Where do you dive in? The first thing you need to do is make sure that you've built an application that's built on modern foundations. We wanted to make sure that we built, a, that we built an application that can carry us as far into the future as the existing platform has carried us up until today. And hopefully even further than that. And the first and most important piece of building a modern, modern application on modern foundations in today's industry is building a 64-bit application. <laughs> will no longer be hamstrung by the four gigabytes of memory that are available to 32-bit applications and now can take full advantage of as much memory as you can throw at the application. What this, means, what this means in practical terms is larger, more complex projects, larger formats, more frames in memory, deeper and richer effects stats. Basically, all of the things that are ridiculously memory intensive now have full run of all of the memory you can throw at the problem. Thank you. I love it. <laughs> so, but the other thing that we wanted to do is leverage the best that, we, that the platform has to offer to us. We've got a unique competitive advantage here at Apple in that we don't have to worry about dealing with multiple different platforms. We can deal with one platform and make it sing. And so the new Final Cut Pro is built on top of the latest OS technologies, obviously including Coco, obviously including things like Core Graphics, but also leveraging the best of Snow Leopard. And so taking advantage of core animation, um, OpenCL, Grand Central Dispatch, and a host of other things. What this allows us to do is build an application that scales from the MacBooks that you take out into the field all the way up to the beefiest hardware that you can throw at the problem. But more importantly, it also allows us to build an application that is beautiful, is seamless, seamless to use, and really helps you solve the problems that you're trying to solve. So that's all well and good, but from our perspective, that's really the homework. That's not the extra credit. That's the things that any new application coming out of, any new Macintosh application coming out of Apple today really needs to do. We really wanted to take a step further than that, though, or many steps further than that, and really look at the problems that you're trying to solve and address them in new and unique ways that nobody's ever tried before. And so, with that, I'm going to introduce you to the new Final Cut Pro. The new Final Cut Pro has a completely redesigned interface, focusing first on the three primary tasks that every editor needs to do 
We have quick access to all of the other things that the pro, pro editors need to do. In, in, including things like keyframing, color correction, taking advantage of secondary displays, all of that. But we wanted to focus on, first and foremost, presenting the, the primary test that everybody needs to do. First, image quality. We wanted to make sure that you're able to, you're able to deli deliver the most beautiful, the most pristine, the most interesting content possible to your clients and ultimately to the end viewer. To do that though, you have to manage, you have to start with a huge amount of media. And to, to manage that media, we needed to approach the problem in new and different ways so that you can dynamically handle massive quantities of media. But once you've got all that media, you get to the heart of the editing system, which is the, ed the editing system within the new Final Cut Pro 10. So I'm going to walk through each of these in, in, in a little bit more detail, starting with image quality. This goes back to the, the modern foundations that I was talking to you about before. We wanted to make sure that we're building an application that delivers the highest quality images possible. And in today's market, what that means is building a fully color managed Final Cut based on color sync, so that you can trust. So that you can trust that the pixels coming off of a profile device track all the way through your workflow to display on the screen and ultimately out to output. But further, we've got a fully floating point linear light based rendering system. What, that's it. So what that practically means though is not only can you trust that the pixels transfer all the way through the playback and rendering system, but when you're doing effects work and anything like that, we're able to deliver the highest quality possible on the platform. We're also introducing a resolution independent playback system that allows you to next format from traditional SD formats all the way up to today's mobile and HD formats and ranging all the way up to 2 and 4K formats. So you can create content from a variety of different sources, lay it back to a variety of different sources without having to worry about the origin of the media that you, you're working with. So but both of those things are incredibly processor intensive. They take a lot of resources. To be able to deliver that, we're leveraging some of the best of Mac OS X. We're leveraging Grand Central Dispatch. This allows us to take advantage of all of the cores on your machine, the GPU that you've got installed in your machine, to, to scale from your MacBooks all the way up to the highest end machines and render your, your work as quickly as is possible. What this means in practical terms is this dialogue that you love. <laughs> The application. So, with every spare CPU cycle that we can, that we can win, so that at the end of the day, you're using the processor resources for the things that, that you need them to do rather than wasting time on rendering. So, that's the image quality piece of the picture. Now, let's get into the organization part of the puzzle. And that brings me to the first feature that I want to talk to you about, which is content auto-analysis. Everybody in this room is dealing with an ever-increasing quantity and quality of media. And you need to be able to get that into the editorial system as quickly as possible and begin editing immediately. And so with the new Final Cut Pro 10, you're able to plug modern cameras such as an ABC HD camera into, into the editorial system and begin the ingest process and before the ingest is even done you can start editing. We copy the media off of the, off of the camera in the background and start preparing it for the editorial process and when we're done we silently sub it out for you in the background so that you're not interrupted waiting for ingest on the way in. But, but that kind of wasn't enough. That's, that's pretty straightforward, but we also wanted to take advantage of the, the machines again to prep your media for the organization and editorial process. And that's where content auto-analysis comes in. We, on the way in, in addition to prepping it for, prepping it for editing, we also do, do things like some of the straightforward things, media detection is an audio still, that kind of thing, that's pretty straightforward. 
but we also kick, kick off background jobs for things like image stabilization. So on the way in, we analyze your media, we give you the option to analyze your media for stabilization so that when you pop it into the timeline, you're already ready to stabilize it, you're already ready to deal with rolling shutter, you're able to deal with all of those things without having to wait for that analysis to happen. It's already happened for you. Yeah. But, but we also wanted to do some things to help you in the organization process. During the organization process, you spend a whole bunch of time doing things to figure out what kinds of media you want to use in the process. Some of those things you're uniquely qualified to do, and some of the things the machine can help you out with. And so with Final Cut Pro 10, we're also adding people detection, so that on the way in, we can identify shots with single people, two people, groups of shots, so that when you go to look for interview shots, you just, you just click on the, on, the single pe on the single people group, and you can immediately get to your media. We do similar kind of things with shot detection. Oh, 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 go back. Um, with, with shot detection. <laughs> um, with shot detection, so we can detect medium shots, close-up shots, wide shots. These are the kind of things that don't really add value to your workflow, but you need them for the organization process. We do that automatically for you before you get them in, so when you're doing your organization process, it's based on things that are specific to the particular piece that you're working on today. But we also wanted to prepare it for the editorial and the effects work, and that's where the one that I just got to comes in. Automatic color balance on the way in. Non-destructive color balance. So that when you bring your media in, we analyze the image and, and gather the color data so that when you step into color correction, you've already got a pre-balanced image. All of you that have been doing color correction for a long time know that this is the first step, but it's not, it's not a good use of your time. And so we wanted to make sure that that was done for you and you can immediately get into the more interesting parts of color correction. <laughs> Similarly with audio, on the way in, we detect things like silent channels, channel configuration, stereo, mono, 5.1 surround, all of those kind of things and prepare it for the editorial process. But we also look for issues with your audio, so excessive noise, hum, those kind of things, and give you the tools to be able to find those things and optionally automatically fix those kind of things up should you choose to. So that when you again go to edit, your audio is ready to edit without the common issues that you run into and you can start the creative process. So that's content audio analysis. talk to you about, which is range-based keywording. Think about how you do organization in, in NLEs today. It's a very static process. You put a clip in one bin or the other bin. If you need to, if you need to find it based on multiple criteria, you end up having to copy it in multiple different places, or you end up having to do things like subclipping and a whole bunch of other things. With keywording and range-based keywording, you can apply multiple different criteria to your media and then go back and find it based on what you remember about your media. So if you take a shot like this, you've got it, there's a whole bunch of things that are going on in there. It's a shot at the Infineon race track, it's an Audi car, it's in the daytime. All of those kind of things can be applied to the entire clip. But furthermore, you can select ranges inside of your clip and apply the keywords to that. So for example, this is a sunset shot. I can apply a, a keyword to that range of media and immediately I can go back and find not only the clip that has sunset, the sunset in it, but the specific range inside of it. Similarly with an overpass, you can go back and find specifically the portions of the media that have what you're looking for. So you don't have to be incredibly rigorous about your organization process. You can just tag it with the things that you need and come back to, to it when you're trying to find it. Which brings me to the last thing in organization I want to talk to you about, which is smart collections. So content auto-analysis and range-based keywording and keywording in general ends up providing you with a soup of information, which is incredibly valuable. Unfortunately, without tools to, to use that information, it's not nearly as useful. And so with smart collections, we give you a dynamic way of organizing your media based on multiple different criteria. So for example, in a shot like this, we've automatically detected that this, person, this shot has a single person in it. But furthermore, we've also discovered, and so in this, in this one person smart group, that clip shows up as well as all of the other ones. But furthermore, we, this, we've also discovered that this clip is a medium shot. This clip exists in the, in the smart collection for media shot as well. This isn't multiple copies of the same clip. This is the same clip in multiple locations based on queries. You can also come up with custom queries based on the kinds of things that you're trying to 
to, to determine. So things that have a particular keyword that are AV clips, that are on real whatever. You can come up with a variety of different things and then find them based on those criteria. So that's the organization process. But at the heart of every NLE is the editorial engine. And we really wanted to look at the how you actually edit in Final Cut and how can we actually look at many of the problems in a different way and help you not make the mistakes and be more efficient in how you get your job done. And so the first example I want to give you, this is a pretty straightforward shot. There's primary audio and video for two different clips as well as some ancillary content that is associated with that and is synced up with those particular clips. Traditional NLEs do a laudable job of making sure that primary audio and video stay together. And when I go to move it, they'll travel with it. Unfortunately, in a shot like this, if I go to slide that down, I've now knocked it out of sync with my secondary content. I have no way of establishing relationships between primary and secondary content, which means it's very easy to forget relationships. Which brings me to the first feature that I want to talk to you about here, which is clip connections. In Final Cut Pro 10, we're introducing clip connections. And what that allows you to do is, first and foremost, primary audio and primary video are locked synced together. On the way in, we establish relationships between those, whether they be both coming off of the same device or whether it be second source audio. We give you the tools to sync those things together based on multiple different multiple different criteria, and then they write together. There's no way for the editorial engine to accidentally knock those primary, primary and secondary content out of sync. You can dive in and fix it if you want, you can change it, but the editorial application won't let you accidentally knock those things out of sync. But furthermore, with clip connections, we allow you to establish relationships between secondary content and primary content, and specifically with the specific samples in your audio and specific video frames. So you can establish the, the relationships that matter in a piece, and then they'll travel together. So if you think about a scene like a car crash, where you've got a bunch of things going on in the picture, you've got screeching tires, you've got the impact sound, all of those kind of things, you can establish those relationships, and then from that point on, they're maintained through the editing process. And more importantly, when you come back to the piece later, you don't have to remember which clips were supposed to have stayed glued together because Clip Connections does that for you. And when you hand it off to somebody else, they can't do damage to your work. And when you slide it down, they travel together. I stole my own thunder again. So let's say for the sake of argument that you're able to make all of the selection that you want and you're able to to, def to collect all the media together to, to do an operation on it. And you want to slide that around in the timeline. As long as you don't have a collision, you don't have a problem. In this case, I want to slide that down, but I actually wanted to slide it down further, so those two primary clips of but. In this situation, though, you've got a problem. You've got a collision in this track. You, you have, and you have to make the choice. You can either pop that second clip out of the way before you slide it over, or you can just slide it over and in that case, you've actually done damage to the second clip just by a simple editing operation. If I go and move it out of the way, I've punched a hole that I now have to remember to go fix. And depending on your zoom scale, you may not have even noticed that that's happened. Which brings me to the next thing that I want to talk to you about, which is the magnetic timeline. In Final Cut Pro 10, we're introducing the magnetic timeline, which is a much more dynamic way of dealing with your media in the timeline. By simply taking a selection like this with clip connections, selecting that, you can slide a clip down to the timeline, things move out of the way. Timeline takes care of that for you. So sync issues and trim collisions are a thing of the past. <laughs> so, both of those things give you the power to create even more interesting and even more complex projects. And one of the things we discovered, though, is the more complex the project, the more unwieldy it becomes and hard to understand. Which brings me to the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is compound clips. Take a shot like this. This is a pretty straightforward shot. When you're doing the first edit of this, every, every piece of this media is incredibly important, and furthermore, every single cut is incredibly important. You're trying to get the look exactly the way that you want it. 
But later in the editorial process, you don't need all of that complexity right at your fingertips. And frankly, it's adding, adding visual noise and visual clutter that's making it harder, harder for you to deal with the building blocks of your story. With Compound Clips in, in Final Cut Pro 10, you've got the ability to select everything that you need and with a single keystroke, collapse that down into a single clip. No. Yeah. You haven't lost any of the complexity of that clip. You can still dive in and deal with it. You can still blow it out in line. But further and more importantly, you can deal with it as a singular clip. You can slice it up in time. You can trim it. You can rearrange it. You can do all of the things that you'd want to with an individual clip, which allows you to build building blocks of a story in your timeline. But we wanted to test this and make sure that this actually plays out in real life. And so we took a project that was cut in-house about the Apple stores in the existing Final Cut. This is a pretty straightforward project, right? I mean, there's, it's got a standard level of complexity. Um, it's not horribly complex, but it kind of shows you all of the same kinds of things that I've been talking about before in terms of primary and secondary content and that kind of thing. And we wanted to test the magnetic timeline, clip connections, and compound clips and see how it played out in the real world with, with the new Final Cut Pro 10. This is what that same, that same sequence looks like in the new Final Cut Pro. Every single edit that was in the previous one is in this. Every single cut at every single frame is in this clip, in this sequence. But because of compound clips, clip connections, and magnetic timeline, I've got a much more easy to understand sequence that I can actually do more interesting things with. So for example, if I wanted to take this clip, this interview clip of Ron at the beginning of the sequence, and move it later because it made more sense, all I have to do is pick it up and move it. All of the things that are associated with it travel with it because you've connected them and they exist in the compound clips. So you can rearrange your story to your heart's content without having to worry about doing damage. That's the kind of thing that later in a cut, we get really twitchy about doing because we're worried about doing damage. You don't have to worry about doing damage anymore. Which brings me to the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is the inline precision editor. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, <laughs> standard editorial operations for cutting between clips basically make up the bread and butter of what, you, what everybody's doing in Final Cut on a daily basis. And we've got all of the tools that you've come to know and love, or maybe you've come to look, know and hate in terms of ripple, roll, slide, three-point editing, all of those kind of things. Those are critical to the editorial process. However, one of the problems with those is that it's really hard to understand what media you have available to you. It's really hard to understand where you want to make the cut. You can slide things around and there's a fair amount of guesswork, or you're trying things over and over again. With the inline precision editor in Final Cut Pro 10, you've got the ability to double click on the scene between two clips and open it up. And you can see all of the media that you've got available to you on both sides of the edit, right in line in the timeline so that you can see and make the exact right cut. You can drag those clips along, you can slide them, you can roll between the two, you can also click in a specific spot, make your cut, hit return, and you're right back to editing. This vastly simplifies the overall editorial process in the nonlinear editor. This brings me to the last thing that I want to talk to you about in the editing, in the editing portion, which is a feature that we're calling Audition. At the end of the day, the most important thing that every editor has to do on a daily basis is make decisions. Whether shot A is better than shot B, whether effect A is better than effect B, or whether composition A is better than composition B. In today's nonlinear editor, that's a, really, that's a really tricky problem. You end up either having to do a couple of things like stacking things clip high in the timeline on multiple tracks and then enabling and disabling to try things out. Or you do replace it, undo, replace it, undo. All of these kind of tricks just to try out single shots. And if you want to try out an actual edit with a whole bunch of things going on, that's actually a bit of a nightmare. You end up having to work in another sequence or all sorts of other tricks to get it to work. With auditioning, we vastly simplify how this works by giving you the tools to collect the options during the editorial process and make the decision when you want to. So in a shot like this, this is, again, this is a similar straightforward shot. You've got an interview shot, and I know that I need some supporting content. When I'm doing the initial rough cut, I don't really, I'm not as concerned about the details of that supporting content. I just know I need some. So in this scenario, 
All I do is during the, the organization classes, throw these things into an audition. Then when I want to go and make the pick, I go over and I click on the audition control, and it brings up the auditions hub, which gives you all of your options right there in line that you can flip between very quickly. You can try them out, and because of the magnetic timeline, you don't need to